Merry meet my fairy souls and friends of myths and legends. Last month I got a message from an American Frozen fan. They had actually started to study Sami culture and the history of the Sami because of Frozen 2. And I thought that was really impressive. And they had read an article that I wrote in 2019. It's called Frozen 2, the Sami culture and the Scandinavian myths. I'll put a link to it to the description if some of you want to read it. I am an old school animation fan. I love animation as an art form and I am also a folklorist. So when I went to watch Frozen 2, I actually paid a lot more attention to the mythical elements than the plot itself. And I was really excited because I could recognize so many folklore narratives. And this person and I, we had a really good discussion about the Sami culture and the film. And we also discussed about the cultural appropriation. And some people have asked my opinions about it. So here is my hot take. Cultural appropriation is simply doing something that is common to another culture, but not your own. Human beings have been approaching each other's culture since the dawn of time. And there are two ways to approach cultural appropriation. There is the respectful way and then there is the offensive way. When my Finnish mom studies Estonian language and makes Estonian food, that is cultural appropriation. When an American buys a kimono in Japan, that is cultural appropriation. Japanese people don't mind that someone buys a kimono because they like that the travelers appreciate their traditional clothing. Estonians probably don't mind my mom wanting to learn Estonian. Some of them might even find it flattering because she loves their culture and their history and she wants to learn more about it that Disney as a company hired consultants who were actual Samis to help them to develop a world into a film that is inspired by their culture, that is respectful approach. When a Finnish video artist, Jenny Hiltunen, made a video installation called The Grint, which has a faceless woman shaking their ass to a Jamaican music to the camera, and she's wearing a fur hat and a fake Sami dress that you can buy from a costume store. And then this video installation is bought by the Finnish Museum of Modern Art as a great piece of artwork. Quote, that is offensive cultural appropriation. When a Finnish or a Norwegian beauty pageant is wearing these cartoonish fake Sami costumes in Miss Universe contest, saying that they are representing their country and they are not being raised in the Sami culture, that is offensive cultural appropriation. The Grint music video, it made a lot of people angry, and not just the Samis, but also a lot of Finnish people like myself. And there was a lot of discussion about that in the press at the time, and this happened a few years ago. Thing is, the artist knew that they are objectifying a Sami woman or a Sami person in the video, and by doing that, they are minimizing the entire culture to something to make fun of. And they did that for the shock value, to get name for themselves. Is it a valuable adding to Finnish cultural life? When it is intentionally racist, then no. Oppressing the Samis, it happened in Finland and other Scandinavian countries for centuries. One of the problems in Finland today is that we are not taught in schools about the modern Sami culture and we are also not taught about the history of Finland being the oppressor. This is also why I like to discuss about these things because I do have a platform and there are smart individuals who like to listen to me and learn new things. It's like what one of my archaeologist friends say. There would be way less racism in this world if everyone would just take a DNA test. There are lots of Finns who have Sami ancestry. When it comes to Disney, films like Peter Pan from the 50s, there's no way that film could be made today in the way it portrays Native Americans in a very stereotyping way. That film was made 70 years ago. Then we have more recent films like Coco and Moana and Frozen. These films were all developed with assistance of people and even animators who came from these cultures that these films are representing. I can appreciate company evolving and I can appreciate a positive representation of a culture that is not always familiar to me. I hope this cleared things up so you can always appreciate someone when they are 
being respectful and they are genuinely interested from another culture. Anyway, if you wish to learn more myths, check out my course People of the Bear, which is all about the bear as a sacred animal. And also I discuss a lot about the similar mythical layers that the different Finnic, Ukrik and Samoyedi tribes had in the past and they are all very animistic. All my courses are available on my site at fairychamber.com. This is Fairy Chamber Podcast, Frozen 2, Sami Culture and the Scandinavian Myths. The Sami people, they're also known as Sapmi and Sami. And as a Finnish speaker, I'd call a Sami person as Samelainen or a Sami, and the language as a Same. And I have Sami ancestry from Lapland of Finland and Sweden. Samis are the native people of Scandinavia. There are about 20,000 people in this world who speak different Sami languages. You know, you can find Samis all over the world and people with Sami ancestry. But in general, most Samis live in Lapland of Sweden, Norway, Finland and Kuala Peninsula in Russia. This is why, for example, in Finland, Lapland is sometimes called as Samenma, the land of the Sami. And Samis were nomads and reindeer herders. And still today, many Samis are reindeer herders. Already in the first Frozen film, There was a Sami influences because Kristoff's character was inspired by Sami culture. His outfit is similar to a traditional Sami outfit and different Sami tribes and regions. They have their own outfits and their own designs. In a traditional Sami outfit, they have pointy shoes and a lot of the accessories are made of reindeer skin. Sorry, Sven. There are several Sami languages. And most common Sami language is Northern Sami, which is sort of a universal Sami language that Samis who speak different Sami languages use to communicate with each other. Then one of the most well-known and most important elements of the Sami culture is Joik. A Joik is also known as Luohti, Wolle, Wolli or Joikus. It is a traditional form of a song or Sami music performed by the Sami people. And yoiks don't have any words. They are pure sound that captivate emotion. There are different types of yoiks. Yoiks for love, friendship, family, reindeers, winter, northern lights, you name it. You might recognize this yoik from Frozen. This yoik is called Vueli. It is the opening musical number to Frozen, written by Norwegian musician Frode Fjellheim and composed by Canadian score composer Christophe Beck, with additional vocals by the Norwegian female choir Cantus, which is also the group that performs this musical number in the movie. The song's full name is derived from Fjellheim's original Itna Men Vueli, The original piece was a mix between a yoik inspired melody and a hymn floating on top of that. This hymn was called Delik er Jorden, meaning Wonderful is the Earth. In the English speaking countries, the same folk tune is known as First Lord Jesus. According to Fjellheim, the syllabies of the song have no linguistic meaning, being part of the vocal style. Vueli is the South Sami word for yoik. A yoik is both a type of a Sami song. A unique vocal style used to perform this, often referred to as chanting. Fjellheim worked alongside Christophe Peck to compose a new version of the original Edna Menvueli. The Disney version was developed by keeping all the original yoke inspired parts and also most of the original arrangement. This was a quote from Disney Wiki. The composer Frode Fjellheim, he is a Norwegian yoiker and a musician and he is of South Sami origin. So the music in Frozen 1 and Frozen 2 all comes from a Sami composer. In Frozen 2 we meet Nortultra tribe. 
and they are based on Sami people. One of the North Fool Trust mentions that they worship the sun. Samis, they followed a nature-based belief system, and since in Lapland winters are dark and long, they did worship the sun as the giver of all life. In the Sami flag, there is a sun in the middle. The sun is also often portrayed in the center of the Sami shaman drums. A lot of the Finnic and Samoyedi tribes in the past, many of them worshipped the sun. Many different tribes in the Northern Hemisphere, they used to worship the sun as the giver of life. Because the winters are very long and dark. And for the Samis, the sun... It was also known as the goddess called Bewe. Bewe was the personification of the sun. And this happened before the spread of Christianity. The, the Samis, they believed that the sun had healing powers over a person's mind. So in the winter, when they would see that some people in the community would feel depressed and sad, that is when they started to do, perform rituals so that the sun would come back. Not just bring warm weather with them, but, but also light up people's hearts and their minds. In Finland we have an actual expression for this. It is known as Kaamos Masennus, a Kaamos Depression. So it refers to a person who, who feels quite down uh, during the winter time because it is so dark. So in autumn 2019, Walt Disney Studios, they made a historical agreement with the Sami population of Norway, Finland and Sweden so that the Sami culture in the film was portrayed with respect and they had Sami experts with them developing the story and the characters. So Frozen 2, it is also translated into Northern Sami. Here's a quote from Arctic Today. If you are the type of person who sits through to the end of film credits, and if you are a quick reader who happened to have a clear view of the screen at the end of Frozen 2, you might have noticed the line in the special thanks section, recognizing the Sami people for their collaboration with the producers, and then followed by the word Verdet, and a list of what appeared to be names. Verdet, meaning friends or colleagues, was an advisory group made of six Sami representatives who worked with Walt Disney Animation Studios, the film's producer, to ensure that the content of the film that is inspired by the Sami is culturally sensitive, appropriate and respectful of the Sami and their culture. The group remits is defined by an agreement between Disney and the Sami that emerge out of dissatisfaction that the original Frozen failed to acknowledge that it had drawn some of its inspiration from Sami culture, including the opening song, which, to Disney's credit, was composed by a Sami musician, Frode Fjellheim, like I just mentioned. After the first film, there was feeling that Disney had crossed the line to cultural appropriation, said Christina Hendriksen, vice president of the Sami Council, which represents Sami interest in Norway, Sweden, Finland and Russia. We recognized a sequel was likely, so we opened up a dialogue with Disney to make sure that if they included details from our story again, that they didn't get them wrong. Working with the Sami, it turned out, was in line with Disney's efforts to come up with fantastical yet relatable and believable words, and resulted in more and more accurate references to the Sami. Disney representatives had traveled to Sami while researching the first film, but working with them on second, according to Peter Dell, Wecko, the film's producer, helped helped to fine-tune details of the film's Sami-inspired characters. We also incorporated details that nod to Sami culture, including the characters' deep connection to nature, Del Wecko told to Screen Daily, an industry news outlet, in December. While the film is clearly fictional, those details, according to Hendrickson, coincide with reality. Frozen 2 isn't our story, but our story is part of Frozen 2, she said. According to the terms laid out in the non-confidential ceremonial version of the agreement between Disney and the Sami, the studio also committed itself to producing a Sami language version of the film, creating training opportunities for something Henriksen calls as a tremendous achievement. In January, SVT, a Swedish news outlet, reported that Disney has also agreed to pay the Sami a portion of the film's earnings. To date, it has taken in $1.4 billion in worldwide box office sales. Sami representatives 
who have negotiated the agreement as well as those in the Verdet did not return requests to comment about the collaboration, but Henriksen described the partnership as win-win. Disney gets credit for working with the Sami and the Sami get an opportunity to expose their culture without having to be worried about how it would be portrayed. This was the first time we've experienced something like this, she said. We are very much used to corporations not to take us seriously. Disney didn't have to reply, but the fact that they did might show that they've learned that. If they are going to tell a story about indigenous group, they benefit by evolving the group from the beginning. Like I said in the intro, this is a respectful way to incorporate indigenous elements to a movie when you work with the indigenous uh, groups. And back to the mythology, Ahtohallan. The way Ahtohallan was described in Frozen, it actually reminded me of Finnish and Sami myths about the land of the dead. I don't know if that was the intention of the filmmakers, but hear me out. Achthalan is in Far North, a place where the spirits live, home of magic, and that is where Elsa finds the spirits of the people who lived before her. In Finnish and in Sami mythology, there was a very strong uh, belief for the ancestors. Like here in Finland, people used to leave food sacrifices for their ancestors under spirit trees. And in Sami culture, they would go to Seita to respect their ancestors. And Seita is like a sacred place for the Sami people. Ahto, Schlas Ahti, is the name of the sea god in the Finnish mythology. He's the god of the sea and god of the depths. And Ahtola is the place where the merfolk lives in Finnish folklore. Ahto Halla, that's Finnish. It means back to ice. Halla is also Finnish and it means frozen or frost. In Finnish mythology there is a place called Pohjola and it comes from the words Pohjoinen meaning north and Pohja meaning bottom. Pohjola is the underworld. It is the place of the dead. And Pohjola was located in far north in the land of eternal winter. In this old world view the world was made of three layers. There was upper layer, Ulinen, and this was the place where the highest spirits lived. Like, you know, Ukko, the thunder god, for example. And then middle world was the place where the animals and the humans lived and all these, you know, nature spirits. And then there was the underworld, where the spirits of the dead lived. These worlds, they were not seen as physical places, but there were different layers of human consciousness. Sami mythology, it has lots of elements from both Scandinavian and Finnish mythology, and uh, Finnish mythology and, for example, Norse mythology, they have some similarities with the Sami mythology. In some Sami myths, the land of the dead is called Rotaimo, and it can be found from, from the bottom of a bottomless lake and in Lapland there are lots of lakes that are very deep and they have fake bottoms. This goes back to the Ahto, the sea god being the spirit of the depths. So Ahto Hallan, it can refer to the land of the dead and the way Elsa goes there it's through the sea. And then the water horse. In Frozen 2 Elsa tames a beautiful hard water horse called the Nok. The water horse is a common character in Scandinavian folklore. In Swedish folklore, it is known as Pekkahest or Nacken, and in Norway as Nokken. In the folklore, the water horse was usually a large, white and a beautiful horse. It would walk on the shore and lure people to climb on its back, and then it would drown them. It was possible to tame the majestic horse with tricks. Elsa and Nok in the movie, they have this um, telepathic rapport because they both have this ice magic. Which brings us to the Finnish water horse myth. When it comes to Finnish mythology, there is one horse above all others, and his name is Iku Tihku. And Iku comes from the word Ikuinen, meaning eternal, and Tihku means tripping water, a freaking eternal ice horse that trips water. I rest my case. And here's the story of Iku Tihku. Iku Tihku was made inside a mountain by trolls. He was made of fire and ice, and he was the first horse ever created. Because he was partly made of ice, he could not visit the human world during the summer and the warm months because he would melt, naturally. He could, however, visit the human world during the winter time, and because Ikutihku was partly made of ice, he had the ability to travel between the human world and the Pohyola, the world of the dead, and deliver messages from humans to the spirit world. Not too different the way the knock takes Elsa to Ahtohallan. 
It makes so much sense now. Trolls saw that Ikutihku was a mighty creature, so that they used him as a model to create the first horses. But they were not made from ice and fire, but from iron, and they could travel between all the words and the seasons. And trolls, they are not very common in Finnish folklore, but you can find a lot of them from Sami and Scandinavian myths, and especially stone trolls, so mountains. They were often believed to be sleeping giants. And in Frozen 2, you know, a lot of the mountains, they are shaped to look like giants or, or sleeping trolls. And of course, Kristoff's adoptive parents were trolls. Mother of Elsa and Anna is Iduna. And in Frozen 2, we find out that she was a North Hultra. And in Norse mythology, Iduna is the name of the goddess of health and rejuvenation. Her symbol is the apple, and she is connected to the autumn season. I don't know, once again, if this was intentional from the filmmakers. Frozen 2, the color palette, it has very autumnal autumnal colors. I have heard quite a few Americans complaining that Iduna doesn't look native or that the Norturra don't look native enough. And this really annoys me because I think the most straightforward explanation is that when first Frozen film was made, the makers didn't were planning to make a sequels and they didn't really think about Iduna's backstory. But even if they did, there has been lots of mixed marriages between Samis and Finns and Swedes and Norwegians. And you can come across all kinds of looking Samis. There's lots of variety in skin color and the eye color. And the way people look, it also varies in different areas a lot. And I thought North Ultras, they looked a lot like Samis because they had very high cheekbones. And, and that is a genetic Sami trait. Now, most people would probably say that I don't really look like a native or indigenous person, but I have very high cheekbones. I'm also blonde and I have green eyes. And my ancestors are from northern Sweden of Lapland. And then there is the Seita. Seitas are stone formations and ancient worshipping places. The Samis, they went to the Seita to leave gifts for the gods and made requests and meditate. These stone formations, they are common all over the world. Most well known is Stonehenge. And you can find a lot of Seitas from Lapland. And these stones, they are ancient. The higher they are, they are closer to the skies and the spirits. Most of the Samis in the past were reindeer herders. So the nomadic lifestyle was a natural way of life for many of them. They traveled to one place to another following the natural cycle of the reindeer. So they would go to the reindeer mating places, etc. So the Samis, they lived in very close balance with nature. And they knew all about the constellations, the movements of the sun and the moon and the stars and the northern lights. The Sami stories and the folk tales, they were told orally from one generation to another. In Finland, Sweden and Norway, the pagan beliefs of the Samis, they were suppressed. And a lot of the Samis were converted into Christianity. And because of this, the old stories, they slowly vanished. So now we only have fragments left from the Sami myths and legends. Because there are many different Sami languages, the written form of the names of the different deities, it varies a lot. The sun was called Beiwe or Beavi. The Finnish language and the Sami language, they are both Uralic languages. So they are both based on so-called Proto-Uralic languages, which are languages that originate from the Ural Mountains from Siberia. So Beiwe, the word is very close to the Finnish word Beiva which means a day, and Päivä, or Päivätär, was an old Finnish goddess of the sun, which is really cool. In the Sami culture, the deities were not always personified to look like people, and the Sami belief system, it was more animistic and more shamanic. Often the deities, they were seen as invisible spirits living inside rocks and rivers and stars and northern lights and such. Beiwe was one of the most important deities in the Sami culture because during the winter in Lapland, sun does not come out at all. Darkness, it lasts several months and even though snow reflects the moonlight, darkness still had its effects on the mental health and the well-being of the people. Sun was greatly missed during the long winter months. Summer was seen as the time of the warmth and abundance. When the sun was in its human form, it was called Beiwe Neida, 
the sun maiden, baby Neda was connected to spring and fertility. Her sacred animal was the white reindeer, and during summer solstice, these people made sun wheels from twigs, flowers, and leaves, and they hanged them into the trees. Baby was connected to the fertility of the earth and well-being of the plants, flowers, and animals. There was a custom to sacrifice white animals to baby Neda in the midwinter ritual to welcome back the sun. If there was not white animals available, animals who had white ribbons attached to their ears were sacrificed. Other traditions that were part of the ritual was to lift fires that represented the sun. There was a cost sprinkle fat or butter to the door edges, which the sun would quote-unquote eat and be- become stronger before turning back to the sky after its long rest. Now this is interesting because you can actually find the similar custom from Egypt where people would actually put butter to the window frames and then the sun god Ra would become more stronger during the winter months. And it goes to prove that all these myths, a lot of them were universal, especially things like sun worship. The animal sacrifices were only made during the winter time. Otherwise that would have been impolite because flames might have been shining brighter than the sun itself. In the Lapland of Sweden, there was a custom to bake so-called sun cakes from reindeer blood. These cakes, they were hung into the trees and were left for the sun to eat. So when the sun rays would touch these uh, gifts, the sun would quote-unquote eat. In the Lapland of Norway, the Samis left sacrificial porridge for the sun. These sacrifices were made to make sure that the reindeers would stay healthy so that the predators would not get them and to cure sicknesses. In February, there was a custom for people to gather together into groups and walk to the ice to watch the first glimpses of the sun after long dark months. Sun was greeted by bowing, and this is a custom that was also practiced by several Finno Ugric and different Baltic tribes. In the Sami mythology, there are three goddesses that are connected to the spring. Sometimes these goddesses are seen as different aspects of baby, and sometimes they are portrayed as three different individual goddesses. There's Salanieta, she was a female spirit who had the power to order the snow and freezing air to leave so she could bring the spring with her. There's Rananieta, also known as Rananiete or, or Radianeta, who was the goddess of the earth. Her name literally means green fields. The third goddess was called Serke Etni, and she was one of the spring maidens bring new life with her. In the Sami Shaman drum, the sun, the moon and the stars are very common motifs. In so-called heliocentric drums, sun is painted to the middle of the drum. The Sami drums, they are quite exceptional when it comes to shaman drums. In different cultures, drums where the skin is completely decorated with patterns can only be found from the Samis and from the tribes from Siberia, which is pretty interesting. And let's talk about the moon a little bit. When the sun was many times described as feminine, moon in the Sami mythology was described to be masculine. Since there was very little daylight, winter was considered to be a suspicious time with lots of evil spirits wandering around the living. Manu, the moon, was one of them. And people thought Manu was a suspicious spirit. Why he came out to the sky during the night when all nature was asleep? And the older stories describe the moon more as a magical and a mysterious spirit. Later on, with more influences coming from Christianity and, you know, more patriarchal, the moon got more of a bad reputation and got uh, features from the Christian devil. And there was a custom to, to sacrifice hay to the moon. This can refer in to older totemic belief that there might have been some kind of animal spirit who lived in the moon. Like you can find this from Japanese mythology, <laughs> where rabbit and the fox are connected to the moon. December was believed the month where, when there was evil spirits wandering around the moon. Moon was sometimes described to be their leader. People were very careful not to irritate the moon. And during December, people did not like to stay outside for long periods of time. It was not allowed to do loud chores like to chop firewood and women were careful not to gossip or laugh. And in February, when sun was coming back, 
people gathered outside under the full moon and they had pans and drums and they would make loud noises to distract the moon and told him to go away so that the sun could return. And the battle between the sun and the moon is something that you can find from many different myths and stories around the world. Suspicion towards the moon comes from people's fear towards the night and the darkness. During the time with no electric lights, when people did not know that much about the surrounding world, it was easy to let your imagination to run wild and imagine all kinds of dangers that were waiting in the dark. But returning of the sun was a promise of hope returning to people. Reindeer. Why reindeers are so important in Sami culture? Why Sven is Christos best friend? Reindeer was the most important animal for the Samis. The reindeer business of the Samis, it's, it started about 100 years AC, around the time when the Samis tamed the wild deer, which started the companionship between humans and the reindeers. The earliest written documents of people owning reindeer is from the 9th century. Lifestyle of the people got more intertwined to the reindeer herding, and some they got milk from the reindeer to drink, flesh from the reindeer to eat, reindeers helped people to pull heavy things, and people made clothes from the reindeer fur. In the 16th century, there was a big change in the Sami culture, and people started to measure their wealth according to the amount of reindeers that they owned. The ways of herding also changed from static to a nomadic lifestyle, and the reason for this was that people ran out of food. In the area where, th where they lived, there was no longer animals to hunt. So people realized that by following the natural cycle of the reindeer, they would produce more offsprings. And herders started to follow the reindeers to their m mating sites and places where the reindeers gave birth. And this lifestyle change made the Sami's connection to the reindeers even more deeper. Reindeer meat, it is very salty. I am a vegetarian, but when I was younger, I did eat reindeer meat. It is a food that you can survive in a cold climate. And this is one of the reasons why reindeers were important to the Samis who were used to harsh winter conditions. Sami tribes in Siberia still now today follow the nomadic lifestyle of the natural cycle of the reindeer. In Scandinavian countries, herding became again static around the 19th century because of political issues and drawing the lines of national borders. In many ways, these political changes, they were harmful for the Samis, especially when it came to the land rights, and these are still issues on the table today and relevant to the survival of the Sami lifestyle and culture. There is a legend in Sami folklore about the white reindeer, an albino reindeer was the most magical reindeer. White reindeer was the leader of all the reindeers. If a human would catch the white reindeer, it would bring them luck and riches and eternal happiness. And totem belief to the reindeer spirit was essential and was also one of the reasons for people to take especially, especially good care for their reindeers. In ancient Finland, when a bear was killed, the hunter prayed that the bear's spirit would find its way back to the star sky and their ancestor. While the Sami people, they had a very similar tradition and belief about the reindeer. So when the reindeer was killed, the hunters and the herders, they prayed that the great reindeer spirit would come and take the spirit of the killed reindeer with them to the land of the ancestors. Only the best and the most handsome reindeer was sacrificed for the great reindeer spirit. One of the oldest traditions was to take the antlers of the reindeer spirit and hang them to the top of the Seita. Seita was a sacred grove of the Samis, an altar where people made sacrifices, and there were usually large stone or tree formations. The great reindeer spirit was seen as a white reindeer or a hybrid between a man and a reindeer. In many cultures there has been deities who had antlers like Cernunnos in Celtic myths and pastoral god Pan in Greek legends. For the Samis everything in nature was holy and everything in animals was holy. All parts of the reindeer had magical properties. This included reindeer skin, fur, milk, flesh, hooves and especially the antlers because they were reaching to the sky and were directly connected to the universe. In rituals, the shaman dressed up into a coat made of a reindeer fur and wore antlers in his head. This was a way to connect with the great reindeer spirit. 
During the ritual, the shaman became one of the reindeers and a servant to the great reindeer spirit. The Sami people, they had very close relationship with nature. The bones were seen especially magical. The Sami children, they were taught on a very early age that when they found a dead animal, they had to collect all the bones together and bury the animal. When the skeleton was completed, then the animal could continue its life in the afterlife. It was bad luck to bury a reindeer even if one of the bones was missing. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for listening. Have a great day and make good choices.